6, so we're going to be looking at Proverbs chapter 5, verses uh, 15 to 23. Um, so I anticipated that, anyway, so we didn't actually cover the first part of this chapter. I was supposed to have been last week, so I kind of already had this one set up for this week. Uh, but let's have a word of prayer, and uh, I'm going to pray, and then we're going to get started. Let's pray. Father, we love you. We thank you for loving us. We thank you for your kindness to us. We do thank you for the wisdom literature and pray that we would be better stewards of it. It's been given for our admonition, for our instruction, uh, that we, we might truly gain wisdom from above. And so as we humble our hearts, look to your word, we pray that you'll teach us from it, uh, that we would better discern life, that we would be found among the wise, that we would be friends with the wise, and that you would protect us from folly. Lord, may we recognize our natural condition as folly, foolishness, and that we're easily buy into arguments that really don't make biblical sense. But Lord, we, as we study the wisdom literature, we're equipped, better equipped, to discern what pleases you and then be a people who are marked by wisdom uh, and rather than foolishness. So we want to be found among the righteous, friends with the righteous, uh, those who actually do what's right in your eyes. And so help us to be those kind of people because we genuinely live by faith. We're marked by a genuine fear of the Lord, a genuine trust and confidence in you. Uh, that delights in doing your will and not our own. And we'll thank you for it. For it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. All right, Proverbs chapter 5. And so the earlier part of the chapter, if you, uh, I'm not, I didn't put those up in the uh, PowerPoint, so I'm going to start 15. But earlier is kind of a warning. And so chapter 5 begins with a typical admonition in these first part of, the, of Proverbs for a father to a son to pay attention to wisdom, lean to understanding. Uh, get discretion, and then he warns. He warns of immorality, and so the first part warns from uh, being involved in, in that outside of marriage, involved in immorality, and so he deals with that topic and warns of the destruction that comes, and uh, then he, he gives them, an, again, an admonition to them to follow instructions and not turn from the path um, of correction, and so and then picking up in verse 15, uh, he begins to celebrate marriage. I mean, he celebrates God's gift of marriage and God's gift of the physical relationship within marriage as that which is meant uh, even for the proper place for that gift to be enjoyed, but also as a protection against the warning of the earlier chapters. So there are those who will be involved. There is provocation. There is temptation. There's all of that involved in a society that becomes increasingly sensual. So when they appeal to sensuality and they chase after it, comes all the destruction with it. That's the warning of the first part of chapter 5. The admonition at the end is to actually find satisfaction within your own home, within your own marriage relationship. Uh, so there's what, the, what in, in using analogy and using word pictures, uh, if you're familiar with the Song of Solomon, Song of Solomon uses a lot of these same analogy, the graceful doe, and speaks of your own well, and the cistern, uh, and again using analogies to draw into a physical relationship between a husband and wife. And so using those uh, to paint a portrait and to then encourage where uh, that is rightly enjoyed. So drink water from your own cistern and running water from your own well is using two different descriptives. So you have a cistern which would just collect rainwater. Then you would have a well that actually had a supply of running water. So you would prefer to have that which has a supply, a fresh spring that is filling up where your 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 well as a well spring so you want to dig and find a well so i don't know how many are in well water and you've got a nice spring that feeds it uh, but that that is usually a lot better than our city water at least most of the time and maybe in some places not uh, but anyway that's the picture and so he's drawing from a common analogy uh, that they would very well understand i mean you live in in uh, that part of the world and a lot of that's pretty dry okay so wells are very important cisterns were needed and so he's using that analogy of something very important to that agricultural society, and, uh, and then he's drawing that into the analogy of drink water from your own well. So in your own home, in your own marriage, this is where uh, intimacy is to be found and to be enjoyed. Uh, and then he asks a question, really a prohibition, should your fountain be dispersed abroad? Is this not meant for the intimacy within a known marriage? Is it not meant privately to be belong there? This isn't something found in the streets. What is in streets is, in, is really the earlier part of the chapter. The harlot, the immoral woman, that kind of thing is what's going to be found paraded in the streets. Sensuality is going to be found in the public square. That is not where, the, the, that where it belongs. So that's the admonition. So your fountain should not be dispersed abroad. This is meant within your own marriage relationship. So when, let them be your only your own and not for strangers, 
Let your fountain be blessed and rejoice in the life of your youth. So if we weren't sure what the fountain analogy is, he really is drawing it home, rejoice in the life of your youth. So there's where the analogy is brought home, and the admonition again to families and wisdom is this is where intimacy is to be found, to be enjoyed in your own home, in your own intimacy of a, a private relationship between a husband and a wife. That's the whole point. And then that is the place of blessing, that is in the sense of where you'll experience the favor of God, uh, from which the marriage itself enjoys the blessing of God, and then there is joy in that relationship. So they are to rejoice in the gift God's given in marriage and in physical intimacy. As a loving deer and a graceful doe, let her breast satisfy you at all times and be enraptured with her love. Why should you, my son, be enraptured with an immoral woman and be embraced by the arms of a seductress? And so there's the warning. So there are the other side, which is going to be that which is immoral, that which is inappropriate, that which is seductive, that which is sensual. So do not be found there is the admonition. Why should you, as in the folly of it all, and that is what he's pointing out. That's what the wisdom of Proverbs is pointing out. It is foolish to believe the lie of the world and what they're trying to say about physical intimacy in terms of outside of the appropriate, uh, the, the, uh, God's appropriate enjoyment, which is in marriage. And so there's where the satisfaction should be found. Uh, there should be a delight between a husband and wife in their relationship one with another, and it would never lead nor look outside of marriage for satisfaction. Uh, that's what the admonition is, again, for Proverbs uh, for there. Then he, he really turns them theologically. So all of that has been laid out, practical wisdom. So find satisfaction within your own marriage. Don't look outside of that. Beware, be wary of an immoral society that wants to lure you in. That's the warning. Then he roots the whole argument theologically, which is very, is, is, I love Proverbs for that reason. I love our scriptures for that reason. We root it back to theology. And so the theology is really clear. The ways of man are before the eyes of the Lord. So if you want to know why, uh, why the, the, you, there's the guard, the warning, and the admonition, because remember, all of man's ways are not, to, are not open for their own decision. It really isn't true that you could decide what makes you happy. It isn't true. Your ways, all man's ways, and this isn't just for believers, because he's going to contrast, right? A believer and a wicked man. So the wicked, those who ignore the admonition, those who ignore the, the wisdom of God, who live outside of that, or so which if you want to apply it in physical intimacy, those who look outside of marriage for that satisfaction are the wicked, and they actually are going to be destroyed by their own sin. And that's the way sin works. It is sometimes called the boomerang effect of sin. You think you're winning by sinning, and the end result is that boomerang comes back and kills you. That's kind of the boomerang effect of sin, and it's referred to many times over in Scripture. So the ways of man are always before the Lord, and God himself is the one who is going to evaluate and bring to judgment your past. That's the point. He's saying you, your life is accountable before God, and this is true for all people living in God's world, because God created the world. Part of the foundation of the wisdom is the very reality in the beginning God created the world. This world belongs to him. It is accountable to him. It works according to his ways, not man's. And man cannot tame the world, nor can man demand the world satisfy him on his terms. It will not work that way. This world will not bow to humanity. It will not work out according to man's schemes. It cannot, it will not. And so that is the profound reality that people will go outside of God's norms when we deal with physical intimacy and many other things to find satisfaction, so they think, to find their happiness. I mean, we live in a day when people aren't even sure if they're boy or girl, whether or not marriage is man and woman, whether or not it should be polygamous, whether it should be all these different things that people are saying, well, this is what makes us happy. No, this is what entertains you for a season. But in the end of that will not be happiness. At the end of that will only be destruction. Can it be no other way? Because all of man's ways are before God, and he's the one that brings it into judgment. And that's the point of the wisdom. He's rooting this argument right back to theology. God is sovereign. God's in control. Your life belongs to him. This world belongs to him. You can choose to live in rebellion, but you will never choose the consequence of your rebellion. Your rebellion will be brought to punishment by the living God before whom you are living. You cannot escape that. That's the point of Proverbs. And so that's what he says. His own iniquities entrap 
the wicked man. He is caught in the cords and snared and in such a way it's inescapable and unavoidable. His sin will destroy him. It will lead to self-destruction. And that destruction is assured. And in fact, that's the emphasis in the parallelism. He is, he's entrapped. He's wrapped up in cords. He is a victim to his own sin and his own folly, his own rebellion, which will end in destruction. In fact, he goes on, he will die. This is speaking more than just physical death. This is speaking of eternal death because the righteous with God enjoy God's presence forever. The wicked die forever. Forever death, forever life. It is not true that people will live somewhere forever. And I know we've said it that way a long time. You were created in the image of God, you're going to live somewhere forever. That is actually not true. You either have eternal life or you have eternal death. It is not forever living in hell. It is forever dying under God's judgment and God's penalty. So it is dying as an object of God's wrath that will never end. So forever dying. That is what the punishment of sin is. That's the punishment for wickedness. It is not forever living apart from God, which is what unsaved people think. Well, I don't want God in my life anyway, so if I have to live apart from God, I'll be okay. No, it's forever dying. It is forever experiencing the horror of death without ever it being broken. That is the wages of sin, the death that will never end. And I cannot describe it in terms to be horrible enough. I cannot describe it in terms enough to scare anybody. I mean, I can't scare anybody into heaven. But the reality is, is the, the wages of sin being death is exactly what we're talking about here in Proverbs. The way of the wicked will end in his own sin, ensnaring his heart in rebellion against God, and it will end in a forever death separated from God and everything that is good, forever dying. And why does he die? Because he would not receive instruction. It's not because instruction didn't exist. Remember, the whole proverb begins with, my son, pay attention to my words, give heed. So give heed, this is speaking even to God's people, give heed to God's word, God's instruction. Go outside of it, choose to live in wickedness, and it may prove you're in unbelief and end in destruction forever. Because God's people hear God's word and they follow it. The nature of God's people. They actually are submitted to the word of God, its authority. Thus, they, they don't live in perfect obedience, but they do follow the ways of the Lord. So the wicked will die. Why? Because they would not receive instruction. Because of the greatness of their folly, they go astray. They die, they go astray, and that going astray is forever lost. So I don't know how many times you've been lost, or maybe, maybe if you're the men in here, we never admit it. We're just taking alternative directions. Uh, so maybe a little side journey. We're, we're founding our, finding our way. But, uh, you know, I, I can... Anyway, if you've ever been in a place, especially when you're young and you're lost somewhere, separated, uh, there's only one thing a young child wants when they're lost from their parents. They want to be near them. Nothing else will console them. They are desperate to be in the presence of their parent. All right, that's a wonderful analogy of how we ought to live our life. We never want to be anywhere in a place where we feel lost, separated from God. At any moment where we do not understand, really enjoy the presence of God, we should, that's part of why we should long for worship. That's why we long for God's presence. As a deer panteth for water, so my soul longs after God. That there is a longing in the heart of a child of God to be in the presence of God. That's why Bible reading shouldn't be labor for you. That's why your reading of the Word ought to be a delight. That's why worship ought to be a delight, because we long for the presence of God. And so those who who refuse God's instruction go astray. They turn from God and they turn in a sense of an everlasting lost condition. Lost in a sense with no hope, terrified with no help. And then when that folly, they die. And that death is an eternal death. So the wisdom of Proverbs is the wisdom of warning against so much of what our culture has held up in this, unfortunately, in the day we live. We live in a day filled with sensuality, filled with all kinds of promiscuity, all kinds of things being exalted as if that is the pathway to satisfaction, but it's the pathway to hell. It is the wage of death. And so we need to hear the wisdom of Proverbs, and we need to speak it, and speak it with strong sounding and sound the warning. Um, because we're li I mean, we're living in a day where everybody, you know, the wisdom of, uh, I mean, this is just for all of our young people. Just remember that God's put a lot of wisdom around you, and maybe it lacks a little hair on their head, or maybe it's all gray. Um, but there's a reason why God puts uh, the church as a blend of older and younger. 
right now, I mean, we are growingly living in a day where there's a despising of the wisdom of, the, of, of those who've lived longer on the earth. Uh, we've, we've forgot that truth is actually passed down generationally. From one generation to another, we pass on truth. And that's even if you look at 2 Timothy, it's a passing on of truth one to another. Paul passes it to Timothy. You task the faithful men who will then pass it to faithful men. Uh, so it, it is a generational distance. I mean, we are entrusted with truth as a church. To pass it on healthy to another generation. And we also need a, 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 those that would come after us to have a heart to learn truth and be able to uphold it. And that, that's just so, I mean, that's where Proverbs lives. It's my son, listen to your father who listened to his father who received the wisdom of God and we are passing it on generationally and sounding the warning. So let's pray and then we'll take time for some good news. Father, thank you for your word and thank you for its authority, its power, its warning, uh, its admonition. Uh, Lord, such instruction and rooted in, good, in the theology of the reality of your sovereignty, of your presence, and that all of our lives are before you. There's nothing that escapes your attention. And the wages of, of, of wickedness is always death. It leads to destruction. Never anything good, never rebellion, disbelief, unbelief will never produce something valuable or important, only leading to death and destruction. And so, Lord, may we heed that warning. May we believe it. May we live as those who believe it and grow uh, in our love for you and your word. And I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.